This is Keys to the Shop, episode 296, Holistic Barista Training with David Castillo of Go Get em Tiger. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show, and I'm so thankful to have you here today. Now, if you haven't subscribed to Keys to the Shop, I would encourage you, hit subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and that way you will be always in the know, updated with new content. And we do have a lot of content airing every month to give you a ton of value. I don't want you to miss any of that, so be sure you're subscribed. I would also encourage you to share these episodes with a friend, Uh, with a fellow coffee business owner, whoever you think could really use the insights that our guests share and the topics that we talk about on this show. And if you think of it, if you have a moment, it doesn't take very long. If you love the show, uh, leave a five-star rating or review over at Apple Podcasts. certainly does help the show's success. Now, on top of doing this podcast, Keys to the Shop also offers consulting and coaching for you and your business. If you're looking to level up your business's operations, people, and quality, or if you're looking to start a new business and get going on the right foot and have someone to walk alongside you, then reach out to me at chris at keystotheshop.com. When you do, we can set up a free discovery call to see if working with Keys to the Shop Consulting might be the right fit for where you are in your business or your business planning. Whether it's remote consultation or on-site evaluations and training, There's a lot of ways that Keys to the Shop can come alongside you and help you build a wonderful coffee business. Again, the email for Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keystotheshop.com. Today's episode of Keys to the Shop is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is one of the world's best specialty coffee equipment suppliers because they bring in the best equipment from all over the world and then they work with you intensively to make sure you're getting the right equipment for your situation and taking the stress out of a pretty stressful uh, purchase. It's a lot of money to purchase commercial coffee equipment for your business. Is one of the reasons why so many people turn to Prima Coffee. Go visit them over at prima-coffee.com. As a Keys to the Shop listener, you can get 5% off your entire order right now by using the code KEYS5 at checkout. That's K-E-Y-S and the number 5 at checkout gives you 5% off your entire order. So a really generous offer, amazing people. And if you're in the market for commercial coffee equipment, I think you really need to check out prima-coffee.com slash keys. Today's episode is also brought to you by the wonderful Pacific Barista Series. Hands down, the favorite plant-based performance beverage of baristas worldwide because it truly does perform on the bar. Everything in their extensive lineup goes through extensive testing with professional baristas before it hits your shelves, so you know it stands up to the heat from steaming, provides amazing texture for latte art, and keeps the balance of the beverage, the taste of the beverage, focused on your coffee. And so I recommend you go check out their website, pacificfoodservice.com, and get some samples in your store. Check it out for yourself. I think you're really going to love it. Certainly, I know your customers will love it. Uh, So if you're looking for the best in plant-based beverages, then you need to be serving the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everyone. Well, today we are going to be diving into the topic of training. And, you know, training is one of these topics that we need to talk about often. It is one of the sources of the most stress in the cafe. If you're a coffee shop owner or manager, getting somebody up to speed, getting them you know, productive on the bar and not just having them feel competent, but having them be confident, seeing that they are thriving in their position. And in order to do that, you need to approach training from a holistic perspective. And we're going to be talking about just that very thing today with our very special guest, David Castillo, who is the training manager for GNB Coffee and Go Get Em Tiger in L.A., David has worked in specialty coffee for the past decade as a barista, uh, a manager, a trainer, and over the course of his career in coffee, he has been able to develop a real keen sense for leading people well, effective education, training, and learning and developing as a trainer himself. 
And in today's conversation, we're going to not only learn about David's career trajectory, but along the way, we get to hear a ton of great insights that will help you develop yourself as a trainer or support trainers that you might be leading in your cafe. We talk about his mistakes, his successes, the biggest lessons that he's learned in the course of his career, and how what he's doing now has been shaped by the lessons and experiences that he's had along the way. So without any more from me, let's get right to it. Here now is my interview with the training manager for Go Get Em Tiger, David Castillo. All right, David, welcome to Keys to the Shop. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, a pleasure to have you on the show. And um, I, I definitely am just excited to kind of hear about your uh, w- the world of training and your experience as an educator and trainer over the years. Uh, you've done a lot in your career so far, and now at GNB and uh, Go Get Em Tiger, you're leading the charge um, for education and training, and that's a huge responsibility, obviously, um, but doing a great job. And and so I guess I'm uh, going to start in the beginning and say, you know, where did your career start in coffee? What kind of uh, inspired you to pursue this? Yeah, so I started working in coffee, it was, I think, in 2012, and I was living in New York, and the first job I had was as a bar back at Joe Coffee Company, and I really got into coffee mostly because I was playing music uh, a lot of the time, and I really honestly just was looking for a job that was flexible, to, you know, the sort of job that if I needed to take a couple of days off, or a week off, or just have like the next day off after playing super late something that afforded that sort of like scheduling freedom. And so I started off thinking like, this is just going to be something fun and pretty quickly just fell into it. Um, I think immediately, like the first thing was realizing that there were career opportunities or at least like growth opportunities that existed in coffee was, that was really cool. Something that I totally did not expect. Um, And then, you know, like as I started learning more, like most people who, who get really, really into coffee. Like I just learned how much there was and what coffee could be. Um, yeah. And so I didn't really get into coffee because I was necessarily like passionate about coffee from the jump. Um, and I think, you know, like I always have a soft spot for people in a similar situation who come in and just are like, yeah, I just want to, you know, see what this is about. Um, yeah, it was definitely, uh, I don't know if I would say by chance, but I was uh, very pleasantly surprised as I started learning more. Right. That's funny. Um, when you see those people come in, are you kind of thinking, yeah, just wait, just wait? Totally. Yeah. Or it's like, yeah, let's, uh, let's show you what this is, uh, what, what this can be about. And, you know, we'll see where this goes. So at Joe Coffee Company, they're, uh, they, you know, they are kind of a catalyst for a lot of um, well-known professionals in the industry. So happens. Totally, totally. And um, e- e- people learn a lot there, of course. And uh, I imagine as a budding barista and somebody who just got hooked into it you know, through that job, uh, I wonder, you know, what your biggest, you know, lessons were early on that, um, you know, as, as somebody who's just figuring out the professional aspects of things, what were the biggest influences on you as you developed as a professional? I think it was really just, um, it largely had to do with the first shop I was at and just sort of like, it was a lot of like the staff at that shop, I remember being really supportive and really sort of like into coffee in a way that they were willing to teach uh, new folks about coffee. Like I had zero, zero experience. Um, And it's funny, I think like a lot of people have very fond memories of their first cafe experience. And, you know, uh, in my mind, like mine was so perfect. Um, (laughs) But I think like early on, it really was just seeing a lot of people who knew a lot about coffee, but were not sort of like they were willing to share knowledge. And I think that was a really impactful thing for someone who, you know, honestly was a little bit intimidated coming into it, not knowing a whole lot, not having done a ton of research. Um, you know, I stepped into this, the store being like, is this for me? Do I, should I be here? And people were just really patient and willing to, to, you know, answer questions, show me the ropes. And I think that's a, that was really like the first step in really wanting to pursue coffee and stay with coffee. Right. Okay. So 
having come from music and then into coffee and then being influenced by people who are really open with information and patient in your development, I'm, I'm kind of curious about how you have experienced teaching and learning be, between music and coffee. Did you experience a lot of people teaching you music uh, or, did you, or, or were you self-taught? And how did that compare to what you experienced in coffee? Yeah, I studied music uh, formally, and so there was actually uh, there's a lot of overlap, and especially training. I feel like there's a ton of overlap. Um, the big thing I think is like taking the time to figure out how to achieve a certain outcome. Um, that's a big thing in music, where you know, like you learn technique, you learn theory, but ultimately, like it's up to you to sort of figure out how am I going to get this end result that I know, I know what it's supposed to look like. I know what it's supposed to sound like or taste like, and like people can show you different steps and different approaches, but ultimately like you have to sort of make sense of it or, you know, it has to make sense to you. And I think that that's for me, at least like I, I sort of take that approach with teaching and, you know, with coffee is sort of like, there isn't one necessarily like one way to, achieve a certain outcome, but there is a certain outcome that you want. And that, you know, I think there are very similar frustrations in getting to that outcome, but also like the reward is very similar as well. Um, when you do, when the things do click for you, you know, when you are able to sort of like workshop things or see things from the perspective where there's that like that moment where it's like, yes, this is how, this is how this works. This is how I'm going to do this. In, uh, I'll, I'm going to stick on the music part because I, I imagine my guess is it might be similar to what new baristas go through. Um, when people just get into coffee, oftentimes they, they latch on to a particular set of expectations or methodologies to achieve that, that result that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, it, did, was that the same for you in music? And then you kind of had that shattered by other people bringing other perspectives? Yeah, totally. Uh, I think technique is the, the clearest part or the clearest uh thing where the, where I, I experience it and have experienced it myself where you know let's say you're learning a passage in music you're trying to like hit a certain thing and you see that it can be done one way and you know that's the way that you sort of just like take and run with and it just doesn't work and it's not until necessarily like maybe someone else shows you a different way or you observe someone else doing it slightly differently and it just allows your mind to sort of like approach it from a different perspective which can be really powerful and i think you know let's say with coffee you know pouring latte art like holding a pitcher something as simple as that i think you know people can sort of latch on to like it has to be done this way i have to hold it this way but nothing's happening and it may take a different approach or just sort of like seeing someone do it differently to really like change someone's viewpoint and really like find a way that like connects that person with um, not necessarily connecting them with a better like approach or result, but just like allowing them to, to experience it a little bit differently. Um, Yeah, that was totally a thing with music where it's like, uh, I feel like early on there are ways where it's like, Oh, there's only one way to do this. Of course, there's only one way to do this when that's almost never the case. A lot of times we talk about training in the assumption, I think, an underlying assumption is that it's the uh, job of a, a trainer, you know, to obviously educate, but to make up for the lack of knowledge in a barista, sort of like a, an understood immaturity. But sticking to just one way of doing things just ardently you know, and not being open to different ways of doing things sounds like kind of a maturity issue uh, that the trainer has to deal with in themselves. Mm, yeah, totally. And I think, yeah, it's like the, the idea of like explaining the why, you know, or like the why is more important than the how, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. where there's like, I think, yeah, there's certainly, you know, in terms of teaching or training, it's like, well, you have to at least understand that the way you're doing it isn't the only way. And I think that's, yeah, I think maturity is a, an interesting way to think about it, where it's like, you have to get to that point yourself, understanding that like, in teaching someone something, the way you do it is but one way. And the real key is like, well, why does that work for you? And why might another way also work for someone else? 
I'm interested in learning how you transitioned from the learner to the teacher. When did this happen in your career? Was this at was this at Joe? Or did this happen when you were in California at uh, GNB? Uh, go get them, Tiger. What? When did this happen, and what was that like for you, going from somebody who was just absorbing a lot of information to now disseminating that information and being the one to sort of guide other people? Yeah, this started at Joe. Um, I was actually managing a shop, and then, you know, I think like through the process, thing, um, just found that I felt pretty comfortable, sort of like explaining things to folks, um, which is you know a pretty pretty key managerial thing. Um, and this is at the point where, you know, like, like most companies and businesses that are growing, like the roles start to shift and people start to embody different roles. And at the time I was actually managing and I was asked to train as well. So I was sort of doing those two jobs simultaneously, mm. which I actually really enjoyed. Um, but there was a point at which, you know, the company was like, well, this isn't sustainable. You need to choose one or the other which in hindsight, it's crazy that like someone was asked to do both at the same time. <laughs> but it, uh, I ended up uh, moving more into training. But yeah, it was, I think the process of sort of like uh, managing and hiring folks to come into the shop and having to immediately be that person who is like, all right, like even things as simple as like the systems in the shop, like, you know, the, the very basic tasks to have to explain that to people in a way that, again, like, not just explaining that they needed to be done, but like, I think the thing that clicked in terms of like becoming a teacher or becoming sort of like an instructor was seeing that in showing people how to work in the shop and how a shop ran, that it really was more successful and it landed on, you know, on, on more open ears when you can explain something like even the most rudimentary things, right? Like you have to take out the trash at this time because of this, like, you can't just do it whenever you want. Like, it's going to be, you know, like, you can't, the, the, the store maybe shouldn't be packed with people and you're dragging trash around. Also, you can't do it too late because the trash will be full. Like, finding those small whys in the whole process, um, I think, was was uh, something that made teaching more rewarding, certainly, and also, like, something that I, I gravitated towards is just, like, finding the ways to have the information land more completely and more impactfully. I like that. It's kind of a answering a question that might come up, but just ahead of time, just in case they're they're wondering about it too. Exactly, exactly. So did you choose, when they came to you and say, this is not sustainable, which is good for them because a lot of people <laughs> will just let you yeah. do that for a long time. Totally. Did you choose the training role or did they kind of see your uh, prowess in that? role and suggest that that would be a better fit for you they sort of let me choose they were like you can manage a shop or you can train uh whatever feels best and it was it was a tough decision like i do enjoy managing also and i i love working behind the counter and that was the part of training that like you know inevitably focusing on training means working less in a shop um but ultimately, I think, you know, like talking to folks who have also trained and just seeing like, you know, I, I feel like for me, training opened up more opportunities within coffee and like allowed for sort of like the cool things that happen outside of retail shops. Um, those things became a little bit more accessible. And that was that was sort of a, a big part of making that decision. But they they really let me decide, which is really cool. And I, I was very surprised for sure that like you're entrusting me with this. That's <laughs> pretty wild. <laughs> What were those things that opened up for you? I saw that at least at Joe, oftentimes like things like events, um, the training team and the folks who were training were often the people who were pulled for those things just because of, you know, when you're not working in a retail shop, there is a little bit more of that scheduling flexibility. Like you don't have to pick up shifts. Um, and especially at the time, you know, still being relatively new to coffee, those were really exciting, like attending and like participating in uh, those sorts of things was really cool. Yeah. And I imagine somewhat related might be the fact that you are a professional explainer in a sense. <laughs> um, and because of that, when you're at an event, it's it's really likely that you're going to represent the company pretty well. Totally. And I think that's, yeah, exactly. Like 
any company who's bringing folks to an event, it's like you have to be the person who, for someone who's never heard of you, give them the pitch. What, what is it all about? In a way, that's genuine. In a way, that's real. But uh, yeah, that I think was like definitely a new experience, but was very cool. And I think like was you know in, in thinking about the steps of getting to you know from new barista to you know current present day, like that was like the exposure to the the broader industry that was uh, really valuable. Right. So what were some of your biggest mistakes during this time as you were getting your sea legs for the training position? I think that, and I imagine that a lot of people who are relatively new to training and, you know, relatively new to coffee make similar uh, mistakes or, you know, approach it a similar way, I should say, where the things that I wanted to do right off the bat was mostly just like, nerd out about coffee like i wanted to just talk about coffee and i wanted people coming in to training to like learn everything there is to know or at least everything that i had to know um and you know when you're in a training lab you can do that or at least like you can make space for that and like people are just going to follow along with your the, the curriculum that you're putting together um that and also trying to get people to really like achieve perfection in a lab setting. Like those are the two things where I was like, this is what I'm here for. This is what it's all about. I'm going to create the best baristas in the world in this training lab. And those two things together, like the, the results pretty quickly was that people would spend a ton of time in the training lab, uh, which I didn't really think about at the time is pretty expensive to pay people for like hours and hours of training. <laughs> yes. And then, yeah, they would leave the training lab. And then like, as soon as that first rush hit and they're on bar, like all those things would go out the window, right? Like all the time we spent, like, just like, cool. If you, if your first latte isn't good, like, let's try again. And all of a sudden it's like, you can't keep trying and trying and trying. You have to get these drinks out. And as soon as people sort of like were in that situation, like it was almost like they didn't really know what to do, right? Like mm -hmm. they didn't, they weren't used to getting it on the first try. Um, and a lot of people also would leave the training lab after just like, you know, really being very deliberate about learning and go into a shop where like that wasn't really ever possible. And I think the, the, the huge downside, which, you know, I don't think happened often, but definitely happens was when like anytime there was a trainee who, you would go see them at the shop like a week or two after they were done training and like the shop environment just sort of like, like, like all the things we worked on were gone, right? Like all the things <laughs> because they didn't apply uh, immediately, like, or they, they don't apply 90% of the time when you're in the shop, like the things you're preoccupied when you're on shift are, you know, side work and task lists and getting through a rush. And the, the focus of the training was, was, the 10% that's super fun and it didn't prepare people adequately, I think, for, for actually working and being successful in the shop. Man, that, I think that sums up so many people's, um, philosophy on training when they first become a trainer. Cause that, that was totally me as well, uh, back in the day. And I guess you could say that it's easy to fall into the idea that you're, you're training people to make coffee, but not to be baristas. Totally. Totally. Um, what did you do to adjust that then? So a lot of the stuff, you know, at least at Joe, like the, we, we sort of shifted the training to emulating service a little bit more to where instead of just like, cool, you have as many tries as you need to pour a perfect latte. It was like working on things like drink cues, working on things like, uh, like, like asking them questions and trying to distract folks while they were making drinks, like things that will happen in real time. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, like still emphasizing, you know, quality and consistency, but trying to throw uh, a few more curveballs in and like actually introduce some of the, the elements of service into, into the training. This might be a, a deeper question, maybe uh, not possible to answer, but were you ever able to see any kind of correlation between the old way of training and this new way of training and how long people stuck around? Hmm. That's a good question. I think it was really in my memory, at least like a lot of retention and a lot of people who do stick around, like 
I, I definitely remember some people who were really into uh, nerding out about coffee and loved that training and did stick around for a long time, um, but just like sought those things out. And there are people who I think like, because I think, it, you know, there's sort of a correlation between like the people who are here for it, for the coffee job, like they, they're here because they love coffee and they're passionate about coffee. And there's the people who more like me are here for like, yeah, this is a cool job. Uh, I think the training sort of like suits those two different personalities um, in those uh, specific ways, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know that one was more successful just in terms of like people's longevity or, or, or sort of like retention. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Company. Better um, training can't hurt though. Definitely. Better training certainly did not hurt. And I think, yeah, <laughs> like ultimately it did get more successful. Um, and you know, like there is definitely, there's always time and space for the heavy copy stuff. It just doesn't have to be right at the beginning. And so I think that was the other part was like, cool, we can still talk about this, but like maybe not, the first week. Right. So when you say more successful, it got more successful. What, what was it that you saw that made you think this is more successful? The big thing is really seeing people leave the training lab and go into the store and just seeing how, how quickly they picked up actually working behind the counter. Um, how quickly, how consistently, like, and how, how much of the, the things we went over were actually applied on shift and i think the the sort of like super super heavy coffee like deep in the rabbit hole coffee training like those things were sort of abandoned very quickly because they didn't really make sense whereas things like speed drills things like uh you know trying to distract people while they're on the machine like those things i think help people adapt to a service environment much quicker and i think that was sort of a for me like the barometer of of the the effect, the efficacy of the training was like, how good can you be? How, how useful of a team member can you be as soon as possible? I love that. Yeah, man, that, that put it on a t-shirt. I, I love it. <laughs> um, so as you got all this experience at Joe and you're coming into your own as a trainer and you're, you're building this philosophy and making effective training sessions and better baristas. Um, now, how did you transition from your role at Joe to the role you have now at uh, GNB and uh, Go Get 'Em Tiger? Yeah, so I moved out here uh, a couple of years, 2018. Um, unrelated to, it wasn't you know like job related. My partner actually got a job out in Los Angeles, uh, and so I was like, yeah, I'll definitely move out there. It sounds amazing. <laughs> and uh, started working at G uh, at Go Get 'Em Tiger, and I actually started as a barista. Um, at the time, at least, the company had this sort of like, not policy, but this approach that because the service model and the way that we here at Yogan and Tiger approach sort of a, a, the, the service and the general sort of like customer experience, it's very, very specific and very different from a lot of coffee shops. And so in order to not sort of like throw someone into a, a, a a situation where they're going to struggle because it's so unfamiliar. They, at the time, were starting everyone at the cafe level. And so I started as a barista. Um, and actually, it was a similar trajectory in terms of like um, position stepping stones uh, at, Go Get Him, at Go Get Him Tiger, where I, within a few months, started managing the shop I was working at, um, and then only recently moved into training. Um, but it was definitely a... Like it, for me, it was a great experience. I really, really enjoyed um, working in the in the coffee shop again. First of all, because you know, as we were talking about earlier, like when you're training, you're sort of out out of the shop, not really working behind the counter as much. And so to sort of like move out to a new city, and honestly, to get to know the city and to get to know the neighborhood I was in through working behind the counter was like the best way to land in the city. I think I would, you know, I I feel like I transition to living in a different uh, place very quickly because of that. Um, and yeah, we uh, we're actually here at the company, like we've been revamping and sort of reimagining our training program recently. And so I started in this role with the understanding of like, 
cool, we are ready to, you know, take a second and just like rework our training from the ground up. And I think, you know, having experience in training in the past has been helpful. And I think, you know, is, is I, I imagine at least a, a reason. Uh, uh, it's it's helped in getting this job, I think. For sure, yeah, I, I would imagine so. And I want to I want to get into that a little bit more specifics about what uh, you're working on and and how you are going about training um, at Go Get 'Em Tiger. Um, I'm interested though to learn as you went and started as a barista again, a shop manager, and now a trainer. I mean, it's got to have felt a lot different than when you first did this. Uh, at Joe and how, how would you compare the two, like your, your confidence, your ability to uh, pick up the information maybe quicker. And what was that like comparing the two similar trajectories, but now with more experience on the other end? Yeah, it was definitely, um, I, as much as possible tried to come in and approach, um, being a trainee, which is yeah, very different uh, sort of experience, um, I tried to approach it as open-minded as possible, like as if I didn't really know anything. Um, because I think you know, like I've definitely, and I think anyone who's trained folks has had this experience where you hire someone with coffee experience, and they the more experience they have, the less trainable they are. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, nah, I know this already. I don't, I don't need to. I don't need to go through all this. And I definitely. I mean, that's always not ideal. And so I tried to not be that person. Like that was sort of like the, the experience guiding the, the, the approach was like, I just don't want to come in like thinking that I know anything. I want to learn everything there is to know about how this company does these things specifically. Um, that was really helpful because I think, you know, like the, the big thing I think that sets Go Get Em Tiger and GMB apart from other um, coffee companies is the style of service. Um, the main thing being that it's a uh, bar style service. We don't have any lines or cash registers. It really is like, we will take your order anywhere along the bar in the shop. Um, we will bring the order to you. You don't have to like go wait anywhere. And that was, I remember being very, very intimidated. Um, it was really unfamiliar and I knew right away too. It's like, this is why they wanted me to start in a store, um, <laughs> and not like in a leadership position because like, I can't teach people to do this on day one. Um, so I think that was the big thing, like knowing that, you know, every shop, every company does things a little bit differently. And so having seen people come in to Joe thinking like, I don't, I don't need you to teach me. I got this and seeing them enter a shop and not succeed. Uh, that was sort of the, the guiding principle coming over here. It was like, I don't want to be that person. I want to just like learn as if I didn't know anything. And, you know, definitely knowing about coffee helps, like it expedited the, the learning process. But um, I tried to just be as as blank, as clean a slate as possible. Wow, man. That, well, that, that's a very mature way to go about it. And uh, that in, uh, intimidating was the word that I was thinking of as soon as you said it, like a new barista coming into something like that. There's so much comfort taken in the queue uh, mm-hmm. for a barista and to have people order every which way most baristas, you know, don't like it when a customer uses the back door to come into the coffee bar instead of the front door. Uh, oh, yes. you know, <laughs> let alone just every angle, my gosh. Um, so when you started to get, you know, comfortable with all this and you became a manager, um, you, you were, was it similar? Like they saw that you were able to teach this style and the, you know, coffee, uh, knowledge and everything else, very well and then kind of tapped you for that position yeah essentially um the shop i was at conveniently uh it worked out like super well um i didn't know la almost at all and the uh the place that we found um to to move into was right down the street from the go get him tiger that had just opened in highland park and so when i was emailing um the, the company and I was put in touch through folks at Joe. And so I had been emailing, um, Ian is our HR rep here. We had been emailing already and I was like, Hey, you know, I, it, all things being equal, like, I know you have a new shop in Highland Park. I would love to work there if possible. It's very close to where I'm going to live. And it worked out 
and it also worked out that like, you know, within a couple of months of me starting there, they needed to, they, they knew they needed to hire a new GM anyways. And so, yeah, just like a lot of it was right place at the right time. And I think, yeah, like it was a new store. And so a lot of the staff were also very green. And so I think, you know, having the coffee experience, having the management experience when that position needed to be filled, it was like, cool. How do you, how do you feel about doing this? Uh, and I, felt great. <laughs> <laughs> being a manager before being a trainer, how valuable was that? In 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 I'll preface this by saying like to me, if you become a trainer right from being a barista, sometimes it, it feels like you might miss some things operationally that you where you could step on some toes, you know, you might not be able to empathize as much as, you know, others might be able to because you haven't been in that position. I mean, how have how has the management before training thing that you seem to be repeating um, worked for you? I think for me, it's been super valuable. Um, I feel like the the way it usually works and the way that I've experienced it in the past is like the trainer is the person who's giving you all cool information and the manager is the one who is like making you do stuff you don't want to do. Or like, you know, like those are pretty extreme sort of tropes, but like that's sort of how those things like, you know, like stereotypically work out. And I think it's, it was, it's important to, to have been a manager, or at least for me, like it's important to have worked as a manager to see like, all right, here's the reality of like, of setting these expectations. And like, here is what it's like when someone comes like, you know, comes from training is very new and like, I have to get them up to speed and I have to sort of get them to, to provide the, right, the, the service that we want them to provide and to ensure that like they're maintaining quality with their own bar. And I think as a trainer, like it's easy to not see what happens after training, right? Like you give someone all this information and all this knowledge and you send them off into the world and it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's easy to fall into this idea of like, well, it's not my job if they like succeed or not. Like I did what I could. And the manager is sort of like, it's easy also as a manager to when people come in and they, you know, aren't immediately successful to be like, oh, like the trainer didn't set them up for success. When really these two things, like there is that point in the middle where they meet and there is a shared responsibility to each employee's success that is both training and it's management. And I think like seeing those both sides and understanding sort of like how everyone contributes to each individual person's success is really important. But those things don't always meet, especially like when there's there's a lack of perspective on like what everyone else's jobs are and how they sort of interact in this way. Well said. Yeah. And you're creating programs of training based around how well you understand the context that your training is going to be exercised in. Totally. Like you said earlier, you know, you train people in a lab, really wonderful. It's good ego boost, but uh, you know, training them for the real world, maybe a bit longer. Maybe the satisfaction is you know a little farther out, but it's probably a lot more rewarding to both uh, do that and also rely on other people rather than just yourself to you yeah. know spell success for somebody. Absolutely, yeah. I want to know about your approach now to training at GNB, now that you've had all this experience um, under your belt, what's going on when it comes to like onboarding and training? We sort of took a step back from training and we're like, okay, like we, you know, we have been training folks a certain way. This is how we onboard them. This is how we sort of like approach people who are in the stores. And we took a step back and instead of focusing so much on the actual like modules of training and the, 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 the training techniques, we thought like, what are our big goals? Like what are the sort of like abstract goals that we have in the training program? And essentially thought like, you know, what makes the best employees? And like most coffee training, I think focuses so much on the technical skills on like actually making coffee and being able to like taste and describe coffee. But when we thought about this and we thought about training in this way, we realized that like the best employees we've had aren't always just the best baristas, you know, they're the people who provide the best service and they're the people who are like the absolute cultural fits, you know, the people who are just like amazing coworkers, they're supportive, they help make your job easier. And like, 
the thing, like thinking about this, like, you know, that being the ideal employee, like that itself wasn't a very groundbreaking thing. Like, of course that's true, but you know, the thing that we sort of thought about was why can't we teach this? Like we've always taken this sort of as like, you know, we'll teach people to make coffee if they provide exceptional service. Uh, it's like a nice extra, right? Or if like, if they want to help their coworkers beyond just like checking off the tasks on the tax task list, it's like, yeah, that's great. Like how lucky we are to find this person. Um, but that's sort of like our first step in sort of reimagining the training is like, well, what if we actually like set these expectations and taught and trained these things? And like the things we always thought of as extra, what if that wasn't extra, right? Like what if that was the baseline expectation? So that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing that we sort of thought about in training is that so much training is focused on onboarding, where all these resources and all this time go into getting someone, you know, giving them the skills they need, like the essentially the 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 baseline skills they need to work in a shop. And all the continual training, you know, just like the sort of like thinking about service and thinking about culture, like continual training was also thought of as like, oh, this is an extra thing or a thing that like we'll throw out there and it's sort of up to the employees to seek out and to engage with. And we wanted to create a training program that was really continual, that focused on training beyond onboarding. Um, really with the goal of continually challenging employees and staff and helping them continue to grow, um, really preparing them for leadership, preparing them to take on more, whether that's leadership at our company, like as a GM, or honestly, like success for us, success for a training program in our minds is like, if someone goes through the training program at Go Get Him Tiger and then leaves and opens up their own business, that is incredible. Like that, that mm -hmm. to us is like, you know, that is us doing our jobs really, really well. Or if they even go to a different company and people are like, whoa, like, you worked at Go Get Him Tiger and you were amazing at this job. Like kudos to them. <laughs> like we, we, do, we, we don't want to stop the training at onboarding or we don't want to at least like stop focusing on people's training after onboarding. We really want to emphasize this sort of like path to further growth and path to sort of like professional development, I think is a good way to think about it. Like it's not just training, it's professional development. I like that. Yeah. In, in the, you're right. There is a, just a front loading of all sorts of resources and time and energy and, uh, in the beginning, but, um, it's also sort of a, a, a default that we, we do. It's not like we're, it's like the way it's always been done. And so uh, hence why you would step back and take a look at your training. Um, mm. but how do you hold yourself accountable? Like what, to carry that out, uh, in, practically speaking, because it, you know, under stress, most businesses want to just load this information in the beginning, like invest, invest, right? But mm -hmm. then, you know, do a little drip of education afterwards. And they would say that that works for them, um, maybe in some way because they, they don't want to invest the time or fear that they mm -hmm. might not have time to do it or it's not practical. I guess the question is, how do you make something like that practical uh, against this method that's been used for so long? Totally. Um, yeah, you sort of hit the nail on the head with just like, you know, the resources and the time being the, the big constraints to doing something like this. Um, the way we're approaching it is first off, just like setting really, really clear expectations for everyone that like, this is what you're going to be expected to do. And those expectations are going to continue to increase. I think like making sure that people are on board with that. And like, that doesn't come as a surprise, like three months down the line where they're like, wait, I didn't know that like I had to keep going. <laughs> so I think first of all, just like making sure everyone is on the same page about what, what the expectations are. And in terms of like actually holding people to this and committing to this, the managers in the shops are huge. And it's funny having talked about sort of like the management versus training sort of thing, like the division of those two um, responsibilities and positions, those two things, like those two roles are both equally um, 
crucial for the success of this style of training where we sort of like in laying the foundation and the groundwork for rolling out sort of this like bigger picture training program. The first step was really just sort of like going through feedback training, because that I think is going to be um, a really key part of this is making sure that everyone in the shops, not just, you know, one person or a couple of people who are working with the training department, but that like the leadership in each um, in each store is able to give effective feedback on people's performance. Um, and then we are hoping to have check-ins and feedback happening constantly, like at minimum once a month, um, so that everyone always knows and has an idea of how they're doing, where they need to improve, and what they're doing really well. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've been working for almost almost a year on sort of uh, reconfiguring this training because so much of the work is just laying out this sort of um, the framework of it and making sure that everything is very objective, everything is as much as possible is measurable and that it's something we can sort of like hand over to someone on day one and say like, here's what our training is gonna be and here's what your expectations are gonna be throughout your time at the company and to have there be enough support and again, enough resources to keep people moving along that path and to allow them those opportunities to continue learning. So it's not taking the um, core skills and competencies and then just distributing them over a longer period of time. It's It sounds like it's actually just taking that, getting them up to speed, making them um, a, a very valuable, you know, valuable member of the team right off as soon as they can be, like you mentioned before, but then having designed more layers on top of that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So the onboarding is, you know, it's still the onboarding, but as people are here longer and the longer they work at the company, the, the more we're going to give them in terms of like expectation, but also in terms of skill sets. Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, one way to think about it, you know, I think anyone who has worked in shops and then has moved into like leadership and management, like that's always, I think the biggest jump. And I forget, I was listening to a podcast recently where they're talking about this in the restaurant industry where they're like, you know, restaurant managers. And this is true of coffee shop. Like this resonated immediately. It's like, managers of these shops are managers largely because they were the best at what they're at what their employees are doing right like the best baristas are the ones who become managers but this the job of managing a shop is completely different from being a really really good barista mm -hmm. and you don't really learn those things until you are doing the job and that was definitely the case you know for me managing a shop you sort of like i figured it out as i went by making a lot of mistakes and, you know, we, we thought about this and, you know, that the idea of layering skills upon other skills and building upon them was like, how can we prepare people to do these jobs sooner? And how can we prepare people like by the time someone is identified as being a great candidate to be a GM, like what if they already had the skills that you need to be a GM? Yeah. That would save us a ton of time. And it would also just like allow like every time a new store opened or every time uh, a role became vacant. It was like, cool, we have all these people to pick from. Like, there are like, there's a whole pool of GM candidates already in our shops versus often what happens is like, all right, like, who, who, who can do this? And like, what sort of like, are we, we're just going to roll the dice and hope that they're really good at these <laughs> other things that like we've never seen them do? Yeah, that's most people. Most coffee totally. shops are, are like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so now have you, built it out how how far has that been built out for somebody's residency there like five years uh six years a little bit shorter within the shop so we're thinking that you know the first year is going to be the heaviest um where the the sort of expectations are going to continue to sort of compound um up until about a year and at about a year our expectations that we're laying forth um and this is especially key as we grow as a company is we want to we want the senior employees in the shops to contribute to um, the training of new staff. Like that's sort of like our our goal for retail staff is like if you can all, if everyone can contribute to the success of their coworkers and the, and the the overall success of the shop, 
like that is we're gonna get so much mileage out of people who have been here longer and longer yeah um and then beyond that like the we have different paths um laid out for sort of like you know leads both lead baristas and leads in our kitchens and then the gms and then to like you know bigger roles like bigger leadership roles within the company um but the heavy sort of like moving the goalpost style training happens or we're designing it to happen within the first year. I really love this idea and this format because, you know, as people are looking at how to do more with less uh, a la COVID and other, you know, just business constraints, investing heavily into your people to bring them more professional development has been something that um, I think is sorely lacking, obviously, in, in coffee because we train people to do one or two things very well, but not beyond that. And just even hearing about the the vision of having this pool of candidates for these positions, you can hear people just salivating about this, like managers and owners, <laughs> like I couldn't even dream of that being the case. Um, but it's it, it's possible. And you know, having this holistic view of what your role is as a trainer and what managers do with trainers and any, any other leadership position in your cafe is, it feels like the future. Feels like this is the kind of thing a lot of people need to take a serious look at. Totally. Yeah. And that's just like a huge thing for us. Like we know we want to keep growing as a company and every company I've seen and, you know, sort of like either experienced or talked to where they're going through a similar growth plan is always like, this is always thing in the way is like, how do we not sacrifice quality as we get bigger and bigger? Like, how do we continue to train people when we have so many employees? And that's, yeah, like it, right now, this is our, you know, this is the plan that we have. It's like, well, what if everyone trained them and what if everyone continued to get better? And what, you know, what we have found and what we're really, you know, banking on is that people actually, generally speaking, I think like the higher the expectations are and the more we challenge people, like the more invested they become and the more uh, like ownership of the work and the more pride in the work they take. And that, you know, ultimately like, yeah, exactly what you're saying. The, the idea of like, how do we find really good people? Well, how, how about we try to, actually develop really, really good people um, very intentionally. Why do people respond that way? Why, w When you put more expectations on them, why is that the case that they invest more? I mean, I think that the longer someone is around and like if the job doesn't change, you know, it's, I think it's just like anything else in life where it's like it just becomes routine and like they the more someone comes in and is like, I can just do this with my eyes closed, the less hard they're going to try. And I think mm -hmm. that that's the challenge the longer someone's been here is like, how do we continue to like create these new experiences and like maximize someone's engagement um, just through like, yeah, how can we, how can we sort of like increase, like, how can we raise the bar? How can we um, like have you take on more, and still feel rewarded. That yeah. makes sense. Well, I mean, as, as you start to do that, I, I think equally so, you would be increasing your support and the structure around something that is in getting bigger and there's heavier expectations. So the foundation has to withstand that pressure more. I mean, wh how, how are you approaching the idea of support for a new system and for the people that have more expectations put on them? Yeah, that for us is the the thing that we are sort of like, um, it's probably the hardest part about implementing uh, a training program like this. Like with new hires, it's much easier because it's like, well, this is just what it is, right? You're coming into this company and this is just how, what we're, this is what we're going to expect of you. Um, anytime the expectations change, especially like the more dramatic the change is, the harder it, it will be. Um, and I think the, you know, the way that we are approaching sort of like rolling this out to existing employees is really just being honest about the, the intention and like why this is happening. And I think explaining to them that like 
by doing this, by you doing a little bit more, the result is going to be exponential, right? Like your job will actually get easier because your coworkers will be better equipped to run the store, to work autonomously. Um, they'll be more successful as individuals in the shop with just, you know, like a little bit of your contribution and training them will lead to a, a much more sort of like a, a much healthier staff. So that is like how we're sort of going about, you know, communicating raised expectations. Cause obviously that's a really hard thing. Like if you've been around for two or three years and all of a sudden your job description is a little bit different, like that can be tough, but I think, you know, really making sure that the, again, the why, the reason behind it is understood that we're not just like asking you to do more. We want everyone to just have a, a better experience to gain more skills and to be able to sort of contribute to uh, a, a more, a better work environment. Now, when it comes to your role now as a trainer, this is not a classic, you know, role anymore. Now, it, it is in some ways, I'm sure, but you're training trainers in a sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now that this shift is underway, I mean, how are you, what kind of things are you preparing to have to change about the way that you do things that might be different from the way that you used to do things, which was, you know, you, you're a good trainer, but now you have to morph into a different framework that accommodates this new system. How are you approaching that personally? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. And, uh, it's something that we've, yeah, I, I have started taking on a little bit that, you know, it's sort of what we were talking about before. It's like, you know, whereas before we're teaching people copy skills, this is a totally different thing. We're teaching people teaching skills. Um, but that really is, yeah, the first step for me is really shifting gears to teaching people how to teach. Um, each of our stores has a lead barista and a kitchen lead who are sort of like tasked as being the in-store trainers. And so my approach really starts with working with them to make sure that they have the tools and they're equipped. Um, and really that like, we're all on the same page that the way that I would teach someone how to do things is the same generally as how other people are going to be teaching in the stores. Um, and with that, the thing that's really important is having really, really clear, uh, expectations, but also like measures of, um, evaluation to where we can really clearly sort of assess people's skills, people's understanding of, of the job and um, making sure that, you know, it's, it's interesting. It really is like sort of like evaluating and assessing teachers in this way where we have to have the framework of essentially testing, even though it's not like it, 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 it feels very school ish. You know, where it's like, how do we get tests that actually measure the teacher's success? Um, but it's similar in that, like, we need to find ways and we're developing ways to really assess people's performance to make sure that the way that each individual lead is training within the store is, the you know, up to standard. And my job really shifts to being the sort of like, yeah, the, the person who constructs and operates the system rather than the person who actually does so much hands-on work with each person. Things are always changing. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it sounds like an amazing change, and I'm really excited for you all and and for you to, you know, get to evolve uh, again in your role. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's exciting. So now, you know, as we wrap up here, I, I, you know, you've mentioned so many things that I think are already really wonderful pieces of advice um, and insights into the world of training and the mindset of trainers. Um, if you could just share like your top piece of advice to uh, a new trainer out there, somebody who really wants to do a good job in their role, um, and has within their power, some flexibility to sort of create some success for the people that they're training. What would, what would you say to them? I think sort of what we started with at the beginning of the explaining the why and the why being more important than the how to me is always the thing that is the most impactful. And, you know, at every step, like, you know, talking about 
training trainers rather than training baristas like that's the thing that's still true is the most important thing i think in getting someone to really understand what we're teaching and understand what they're teaching is to understand why it is that we're doing it what it is that will get the desired result and not just focus on like a singular technique or a singular approach um, and I think, you know, to me, the, the most successful teachers and the most impactful teachers are the ones who can really find different ways of communicating an idea and leading someone to success rather than having everyone stick to like one single curriculum or one single approach. And anyone who doesn't get it just doesn't get it. Um, I think finding those ways to really understand and to communicate the why I think is is the the most to me the most important thing as a trainer right back to the beginning and uh, exactly. always always will be true for sure uh, David this has been a wonderful conversation um, I'm sure we could talk much more about this um, but yes. you've you've <laughs> certainly uh, shared some very valuable stuff. So I thank you for being on the show. Um, if people want to follow you on Instagram, uh, you know, how can they do that? And, you know, where can they go to learn more about Go Get Em Tiger and GMB Coffee? Yeah, so on Instagram and on social media, uh, the company is at G-G-E-T-L-A. Um, my own Instagram is at Hello It's David. Um, but there's mostly pictures of dogs on there. So uh, maybe a little bit less... Uh, important for <laughs> coffee stuff, but very important for dog content. Yeah. <laughs> um, but GGETLA um, is where a lot of our uh, company updates are. Um, yeah. And oh, and at GNB Coffee, two different Instagrams, uh, same same umbrella company. Well, again, thank you so much. This has been wonderful, and uh, all the best to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is fun. I appreciate uh, you taking the time as well. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that interview. A huge thank you to David for joining us on the show. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your experiences and your hard-earned insights with us at Keys to the Shop. I so love that we started and ended with this emphasis on you know, explaining the whys all along the way. And it fits so well with the idea that you know it's more about professional development than it is just teaching a very narrow skill set of barista skills, you know, bringing people up as professionals as an industry should be our collective next level effort. And it's so exciting to hear uh, what they're doing and to hear David's story and how he got to where he is today. So again, thank you, David. If you want to follow David on Instagram, his handle is at Hello, it's David. And also on Instagram, you can follow Go Get em Tiger at G-G-E-T-L-A. And of course, their website, ggetcom Now, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, or you just want to say hi, uh, please email me, chris at keystotheshop.com. It's also where you can reach out if you're interested in Keys to the Shop Consulting. Again, that email, chris at keystotheshop.com. Now, as we've been talking with somebody today from Southern California, you know, coming up in Anaheim very soon in August is Coffee Fest trade shows. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Coffee Fest trade shows. Been doing them for you know a very long time, in <laughs> 2004. I've been training and uh, teaching and judging, and I think. Uh, as somebody who knows this uh, trade show very well, this is probably the best thing you could attend if you're looking to learn how to build a thriving coffee retail business. Uh, when you go to coffeefest.com, click on the shows that are coming up, uh, Anaheim in August and then Portland in November, and look at what is offered. There are a ton of free and accessible uh, lectures, workshops, trainings. Of course, there's the trade show floor and then the community the throwdowns, the competitions. There is a ton going on at Coffee Fest every time, and you will leave not only equipped, but energized, I guarantee it. So I'll be at all of the shows, and I hope to see you there. To register now, go check them out over at coffeefest.com. Again, that website, coffeefest.com. And with that, it is the end of our show. Everybody, thank you so much. I really appreciate you all being listeners to this show. 
It's been so fantastic to come up on almost five years of doing Keys to the Shop, and I'm definitely looking forward to five more. And it's because of folks like you that I get to do this, and I want to keep on adding value to your uh, hobby lives. And so <laughs> thank you again. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you Keys to the Shop.